Call for introductions. Seeing no inter no further introductions, it is now time for member statements. The member from Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Sukkot is a Jewish holiday that takes place five days after Yom Kippur. Historically, Sukkot commemorates the 40 years in which the children of Israel spent wandering in the desert, living in temporary shelters or booths after fleeing slavery in Egypt over 3,000 years ago. Agriculturally, it is a major harvest festival with an abundance of fresh fruit, vegetables, and nuts. Over the seven-day holiday, the Jewish people are expected to eat all their meals in a sukkah. When I was a child, everybody's sukkah looked pretty much the same, plywood walls with leafy branches for the ceiling, and it was the children's job to do artwork to decorate the sukkahs, which are placed in backyards all across the province and country and uh, around synagogues as well. Sukkot is not just about gathering food from the harvest. It's a week-long celebration spent gathering with friends and relatives. Last night, my family and I had dinner in Rabbi Janowski's large sukkah in Thornhill. And I just want to finish with a quick joke. The first, imagine the first Jewish president of the United States calls to invite his mother for Sukkot, but she tells him, I don't like to travel. Come on, Ma, it's going to be great. I'm going to send the Air Force One to pick you up. I'd really rather not. Ma, there'll be a limo to meet you at the airport. It's really much too tiring. Ma will have lots of big shot politicians and famous celebrities for parties at the White House sukkah. All right, I'll go. When she returns, her neighbor asks where she went for Sukkot, to one of my sons. The doctor, the neighbor asks. Nah, the other one. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Jocularity. <laughs> the member from Essex. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. You know, I rise again uh, completely dismayed at the status of our education system under the watch of the current Liberal government. Speaker, there is no question that this system, under the watch of the Liberals, is in complete chaos. We only have to look at how they're treating our education, education workers. Uh, they won't bargain in earnest with them. They had to file a, a, a grievance, a, 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 a charge of bad faith to finally get this government to, to uh, return to the table to bargain with them. In fact, the Liberals' own very, very own budget states that they will commit it. They are committed to cutting $500 million from education by 2017. And, Speaker, they are well on their way. They have five schools in my area, Harrow Public School, Harrow High School, General Amherst, Kingsville High School, and Western Secondary School that are on the chopping blocks. These are schools that are foundational in our communities. You cannot simply warehouse uh, students in rural Ontario and expect to get the same results. These are small community schools. They're the lifeblood of these schools. And I'll tell you, the two of them that are uh, most precious to our communities, Harrow High, they've been fighting for their high school for years and years, and Western Secondary, which is the only vocational school anywhere from Windsor to Sarnia that you'll find. They have an a, 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 a amazing program there, uh, industrial kitchen, uh, shop, uh, metal, metal working. This is where you're going to train those workers of tomorrow, but you're going to cut that school. I'm going to tell you, here's a warning. You're going to have parents and, and community members chain themselves to the door Thank you. to protect those schools. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I rise today to kick off the first ever Hispanic Heritage Month in Ontario. Hey. This past May, my first bill as MPP, Bill 28, enacted to declare October as Hispanic Heritage Month, was passed in the Ontario Legislature. By proclaiming the month of October as Hispanic Heritage Month in Ontario, our province will recognize the rich contributions of Hispanic and Latino Canadians to our social, economic, political and multicultural fabric. Speaker, I'm very proud that Ontario is home to more than 400,000 Canadians of Hispanic and Latino origin. As early as 1914, Canadians who were originated from Latin America and Spain began immigrating to the province, and today the Hispanic Latino community is one of the fastest growing and diverse groups in our province. I'm truly humbled to personally represent 10,000 members of the Hispanic Latino community in my riding of Davenport. Whether you're a new immigrant to Ontario or a second or third generation Canadian, it means something to belong to a cultural community. It is important for us to be proud of our roots. Mr. Speaker, I want to take this opportunity to urge all members to join me tonight for a reception in rooms 228 and 230 to recognize and celebrate the first Hispanic Heritage Month in Ontario and to pass by room 212A for an exhibit showcasing art from the Hispanic and Latino community. I'm truly grateful that I was able to make Hispanic Heritage Month a reality in Ontario. Muchas gracias, Mr. Speaker. Good job. Thank you.
The uh, member statements, the member from Bruce Gray, one South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise today and recognize the important role the Muslim community plays in the shaping and building of the free, free peaceful, and pluralistic province we all have the privilege to live in. The Muslim community does amazing work to enrich our beautiful province, and I commend their continued efforts to promote cultural understanding and harmony. I had the privilege of attending an Eid celebration in Mississauga recently, together with the leader of the official opposition, Patrick Brown, where we met with many community leaders and had an opportunity to learn more about Muslim culture and their leaders' efforts in building greater understanding and unity across our diverse communities. I also had the privilege of attending Canada, the Canada-Pakistan Business Council Awards, which highlight the positive economic impact of the efforts of a very entrepreneurial culture. This, of course, extends to the social and community benefits that our communities, province and country enjoy as a result of the efforts of the Muslim community. This month, we celebrate Islamic History Month in Canada, a celebration of the rich history of a civilization. Islamic History Month in Canada gives the Muslim communities throughout the country an opportunity to share the rich heritage of the Muslim world, the contributions made by Muslim scholars and inventors, and the valuable stories of Muslim people who now make up over 25% of the Earth's population. On behalf of Patrick Brown and the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party, I applaud the Muslim community for their great efforts and contribution to our great province and country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Statements? Member from Trinity Spadina. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, Chinese Canadians across the province celebrate the 66th uh, National Day of the People's Republic of China. Since 1949, China has undergone tremendous trans transformations. Today, it's one of the world's most influential nations and drives the second largest economy. In 1999, the Chinese government expanded the celebration by several days to give its citizens a seven-day vacation, which is also known as the Golden Week. The Golden Week uh, was intended to help tourism market make long-distance family visits and to improve the national standard of living. And an estimated 28 million Chinese traveled during the first National Day Golden Week in 1999. And in 2007, this number has increased to over 120 million people. This has tremendous impact uh, on countries like Canada, specifically in Ontario, where a lot of Chinese families have settled, have settled. In fact, I have four friends from China touring Ontario this week. Canada and China's strong relationships are the work of many visionary pioneers. 45 years ago, Pierre Elliott Trudeau led the first official visit to China. In 1985, Pierre, uh, Premier Peterson signed a friendship accord with Jiangsu. And last year, Premier, of course, led her delegation to China, which resulted in $966 million in foreign investment. And today, as a member representing Chinatown and a Chinese-Canadian uh, uh, um, heritage, um, I would like to say happy birthday, China, and I would like to invite all members of this House to join us at the South Lawn for the flag raising at 4.30. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, sadly, Ontario's credit union system and the Niagara community at large have lost a true champion with the recent passing of Meridian Credit Union's founding CEO, Sean Jackson. I know uh, my colleagues here that knew Sean will join with his wife, Joanne, their daughter, Kayleen, in mourning Sean. And I want to use a moment today to celebrate his contributions to the province, to the credit union system and the Niagara community. Uh, he's been remembered by people who knew him and worked with him as having an incredible passion for people. It's what drove Sean's business success, his leadership style, and his exemplary community work. And it's a quality in Sean that um, I got to know over many years as a Niagara MPP that I admired personally and saw in action. Described as a one-of-a-kind leader, Sean joined Niagara Credit Union in 1983 and within 10 years had climbed the ladder to become its CEO. And when it merged with HEPCO Credit Union in 2005 to form Meridian, Sean became the first Meridian CEO and saw the company through exponential growth to become Ontario's largest credit union. Under his leadership, Meridian became one of Niagara's most generous corporate donors, supporting many community initiatives, speaker, including scholarships and partnerships with charitable organizations. His generosity didn't end there. He led the Niagara Community Foundation as a founding director, was a leader in the Hotel Du Hospital, past vice chair of the Way campaign, and worked with big brothers and sisters of Niagara. And I have one last thing, Speaker. They actually have named a scholarship after Sean Jackson as well. It's a commitment to community scholarship. 
It will recognize, like Sean, an Ontario student who has a big heart, who gives back to the community and also excels academically. What a fantastic way to recognize Sean's legacy in the peninsula. Thank you, Speaker. Members, the member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. I have spoken about U.S. Steel's many times in this legislature. I've repeatedly urged government ministers to act. I've spoken at rallies in support of the workers and pensioners. I have twice introduced legislation to strengthen the province's pension protection fund. U.S. Steel bought Stelco back in 2007 with government assistance contingent on its promises to maintain production and jobs. It has broken those promises again and again, enabled by the federal government, and now it brazenly threatens thousands of Ontario jobs and pensions. It is a disgrace that U.S. Steel intends to suspend all obligations to pay post-employment benefits, health, medical and dental, and insurance in order to pad the pockets of their U.S. parent company. Earlier this month, it transferred many of its Canadian contracts to the U.S. plants. Now it says it's losing money off contracts, which is caused means it's too poor to meet its obligations. It wants to stop paying municipal property taxes as well. It wants to stop paying post-employment benefits, health, medical, dental and life insurance. A slap in the face to the retirees who have suffered tremendous health difficulties because of their work. These benefits are dependent on by retirees like people who have spent 30 to 40 years in the industry. In, in, in uh, many cases, all the company in a town that had always been proud of its royal role in the steel industry. Now the benefits are deferred wages negotiated through collective agreements. They're not handouts. These were negotiated over the years. Speaker, this is a disgrace, and this is, a, is, a, is also going to happen in many other situations in our country if we don't lock down this situation. Thank you. <laughs> member from York Centre. Mr. Speaker, this morning I had the honour and privilege to stand with Premier Wynne, Minister Hoskins, Minister Sergio, MPP Albanese, Paul Allison, Dr. Ruben Devlin, Bob Carlin, Don Loeb, all of Humber River Hospital when I attended the official ribbon-cutting ceremony for the new Humber River Hospital, which is located in my riding York Centre. The hospital will be fully operational as of October the 18th and will service the communities located in the Northwest GTA. Humber River Hospital's redevelopment plan which was approved by our provincial government, saw the official groundbreaking ceremony take place on December the 2nd, 2011. Since then, 1,300 dedicated and skilled workers diligently worked each day, every day, to ensure the hospital was completed on time and on budget. This state-of-the-art facility is North America's first fully digital hospital and will focus on using the latest technology to treat patients more efficiently and effectively. The 1.8 million square foot hospital will offer greater access to high quality acute care hospital services, have reduced wait times, expanded emergency services, and modern diagnostic equipment for better patient diagnosis and treatment. In addition, it has updated its infectious disease containment systems to monitor and prevent a broad range of infections. As the MPP of York Centre, I take great pride that this project has finally been completed because I know the immediate, enormous, and positive impact it will have on the surrounding communities. The new Humber River Hospital will revolutionize how health care services are delivered in York Centre and beyond, and is yet another shiny example of how the Wynn government is committed to meeting and surpassing the health care needs of Ontarians. Thank you. Thank you. The member, statement, the member from Scarborough Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to talk about Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD, a neurobiological disorder and the most common childhood mental health condition. October is known as ADHD Awareness Month, and I would like to raise public awareness of this lifelong mental health issue currently affecting more than one million Canadians. It is estimated that ADHD affects one to two children in every Ontario classroom and four out of every 100 employees in the province. Recognizing the seriousness of ADHD, the Ontario government has invested almost $900 million in mental health services since 2013. And in 2014, the government provided $440 million specifically to children and youth mental health sectors. 
Across the province and in my riding of Scarborough Asian Court, the number of individuals and organizations working tirelessly to support individuals with ADHD and their families every day. And Mr. Speaker, I'd like to recognize them. Heidi Bernhardt, a resident of Oak Ridges and Markham, and the constituents of Minister of Community Social Services, Helena Jasek, for her work in the leadership with the Center for ADHD Awareness Canada, Catherine Chan and her colleagues at Hong Fook Mental Health Association, helping individuals overcome cultural barriers to access mental health services. Mr. Speaker, with October being ADHD Awareness Month, I encourage Ontarians to increase their awareness and share the message about ADHD. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I thank the member from Scarborough Agent Court on a point, point of order. Point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I apologize to the member. I have some visitors from the ADHD community who are visiting the legislature. I'm going to welcome, welcome them and also recognize them. Heidi Bernhardt, Russ Lerbant, Charlene Isabrito, Jim Parson, Sheila Hornhauser, and Pierre Seguin. Welcome to Queen's Park and thank you for what you do every day for ADHD community. Thank you. We welcome our visitors. Again, I thank all members for their statements. It is now time for reports by committee.